Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, so thank you for joining us in this webinar of, uh, yeah, entitled Fault Detection. And, um, uh, so sorry, there we go. And um, yeah, this is uh, this is hosted by Syme and Sakak, uh, whose, whose logo I forgot to put on the on the introductory slide. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, but yeah, and in in the way of introductions, so I'll introduce myself and then I'll hand over to uh, Clyde. So my name is John Atherfold. Um, I'm a data science specialist at Optimum Solutions, and I have been for about the last three years. Um, I work with our smart mining and manufacturing focus area. So that means yeah, working with quite a few of our industrial clients and quite a few of uh, our mining clients as well. And what we do for them is design intelligent control systems. So it's one of the things as well as yeah, a number of, a number of things, but I've got a bit of a slide on that later. Um, yeah, what I do is design, well, what, what I'm cur currently busy doing is designing machine learning models that um, assist with APC control. Okay, um, I've got a background in mechanical engineering and I've also got a master's in computer science. So just a bit about me. All right, Clyde. John, I'm not sure if, um, if you could maybe not share, I'm not sure if you can see me on screen. Oh, you're gonna, are you gonna share your screen? Yeah. Just for the introduction and then uh, continue with the slides, yes. Uh, say again, Clyde, sorry. Missed you there. If you could unshare, John. Oh, sure. Excellent. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> hi everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Diane London Gomzami, or also known as Clyde. Um, I'm a control technology specialist at the uh, Anglo-American Platinum, uh, and that's within the, the process instrumentation and control department. Uh, so our role is to support all of our sites with um, all of the process monitoring and, and advanced process control that's across our sites. Uh, so we are actually a central service um, to our various operations. Uh, my role specifically deals with, uh, with analytics uh, as well as some of the application support uh, and getting some of the, um, some of, some of the monitoring um, systems in place as well as some of the monitor, uh, monitoring reports. Uh, my background is in chemical engineering, so I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, and I'm currently studying a master's degree in chemical engineering as well. So, yeah. um, so I'm going to start sharing my slides and begin the presentation. Okay, uh, yes, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, please can you confirm if, if my screen share is, is, is working? Uh, yeah, we can yes. see it. Thanks. Excellent. Yes, uh, so, so just a brief introduction to, um, to today's content. At first, we're gonna, we, we're gonna, I'll be presenting a little on the introduction to fault detection. Uh, they'll cover a little bit on the framework of fault detection and how it is done. Um, next, we'll move on to a case study at the, uh, at the ACP where we perform fault detection for a leak, uh, fault detection, for a leak detection problem. Um, then I'll move on to John, uh, and John will present a case study uh, where he has uh, used fault detection to detect boiler trips. And finally, we end the session with uh, a Q&A at the end. Um, there's also um, a, a widget of, on the Zoom platform uh, where you can post your Q&A questions and we'll uh, attend to them towards the end of the session. Okay, so first, um, a little introduction on Industry 4.0. Uh, so the term Industry 4.0 represents the hot industrial revolution, uh, and this encompasses organization and control over the entire value chain uh, of the life cycle of products. So Industry 4.0 is resultant from developments and improvements uh, from previous um, industrial revolutions. Um, and the third industrial revolutions began around about in the 1970s. And this gave rise to the use of programmable logic controllers, as well as IT systems for machine and process automa uh, automation. Um, in, in modern process industries, the uh, industrial internet of things is the collective description given to the numerous sensors to collect data. Uh, these sensors then turn physical conditions of an object into electrical signals. Uh, and then these are passed on to uh, PLCs or distributed control systems for further actions. Uh, the use of I IoT technologies continuously con uh, creates real-time data. 
um, advances in the IT field make the process of data acquisition and storage easy, increasingly easy and convenient. Uh, and this data is collected at high frequency, high dimension, and large variety. Uh, and usually this cannot be treated by simple means. Um, there is a progressive shift from traditional pr uh, production control and automa automation systems uh, to intelligent solutions to satisfy um, current pl uh, flexible processing requirements. Uh, the technologies used in Industry 4.4 are not new. Uh, however, it's a combination of the these technologies um, aligned with business processes um, that enables Industry 4.4, 4.0, sorry. Next. Okay, uh, so uh, on the topic of fault detection, I think it's good for us to start with uh, just a few definitions uh, and distinguishing fault, uh, fault, fault disturbances and failures. Um, so a disturbance is an unknown or uncontrolled input acting on a system. Um, a fault is an unpermitted deviation, and this, this usually is um, characterized by one or more um, process variables exceeding a certain range. And a failure is then, um, a permanent interruption of a system to not perform um, within the, the given constraints. So generally speaking, uh, a disturbance is what's actually handled or maintained by a process control system. Uh, so where small fluctuations in the process can actually be brought back into control. Uh, and that's what a disturbance is. Uh, whereas a fault is something that's a slightly more unconventional and it's possibly not controlled um, in the process. And um, multiple faults then usually end up in, in a failure or a, a cease of the system to operate uh, properly. Um, there's also various fault mechanisms um, that they can actually be experienced in, in industry. Uh, and these usually occur um, in, in, in multiples of more than one fault. Uh, the first type of fault is an induced fault where one or more faults actually work together to produce a, a, a new type of fault and, and that's the induced fault class. Um, there's also independent faults where faults are, uh, are acting in, in, in a non-continuous way with each other. Uh, the must fault is when faults actually occur and, in, and it's actually hidden between um, a, a much more stronger fault that's evident from, from the process data that you have. And finally, the, there's dependent faults where uh, faults are propagated through the system and um, these actually end up as, as a new type of fault that is a combination of one or more uh, root cause faults. So the process monitoring loop is, is typically then um, a model to describe how the fault detection is performed. Uh, generally, fault detection is performed continuously uh, and is always a trigger then that, that, that basically uh, lets us know when uh, a fault has been detected. Now, once we have detected the fault, we then move into the fault diagnosis, um, fault diagnosis stage, which consists of the fault isolation and fault identification. And once we've identified the fault, we start to rectify the process, and, and this brings us back into uh, the loop of fault detection. So, so, so generally, uh, this the process monitoring loop consists of the the key um, the key aspect of fault detection, and and this really triggers off the recovery of the process. We could also then more formally look at um, the fault detection in terms of a framework. Uh, and in here, we've split out the fault detection in, in four different spaces. And uh, this consists of the measurement feature, decision, and class spaces. And I'll go on to explain that uh, in a little more detail. The measurement space is, um, is, is actually the representation of the raw sense information that we have on the system. Uh, usually, this is collected and stored in some sort of historian. Um, and, and this basically just stores all of the data and the information from the raw sensors that we have. Uh, prior to use for fault detection, we may need to treat this data uh, as this could have some uh, inconsistencies or um, um, that captures or erroneous data that, that's contained within. Um, th th this could result from, from instrumentation failure, um, equipment failure, or multiple other faults. Uh, so prior to using um, this data in, in the fault detection space, we would need to ensure this data is, is clean and fit enough for our intended uh, measurement processes. Um, the next step is then the feature space. And this is really when we uh, encode the knowledge uh, using the information that we have from the sensors. Uh, this is usually done through the use of models. Um, and um, these models could be either first principles 
or uh, first principles based based on uh, thermodynamic and chemical laws or um, material and energy balances. Or alternatively, this could be data driven, which is uh, directly inferred from the data that we have using these types of models. Um, there's also a growing field now where uh, the models are actually hybrid. So there's a, a certain element of first principles um, and knowledge where we encode um, a first principle knowledge as well as uh, supplementing that with uh, the data driven aspect or the, or the model um, information that we found from, um, from modeling. Um, so this just gives you a brief overview of the different uh, major classes of models again. Uh, process history is, is data driven uh, and then the fundamental are uh, first principle models. Uh, these could be further split out into quantitative and qualitative types of models. Uh, under the first principles uh, for quantitative models, these are usually represented in terms of mathematical equations, uh, such as algebraic, differential, or time-based equations. Uh, there's also qualitative first, uh, first principle types of models, and these include the cause and effect models as well as causal models. Uh, under the pro process history or data-driven class, we move into the, the quantitative uh, as well as qualitative again. Uh, the quantitative really speaks to the statistical and computational models, uh, and these may include machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, and again, the qualitative, um, usually, uh, I think a good example for qualitative types of models are expert systems. Uh, once we have the model that encodes uh, the domain knowledge, we can then move into the, de uh, the, de uh, the decision space. Um, the, de the, de the decision space is uh, basically used uh, to determine if the fault has been identified. Um, and for continuous data, we usually use this word um, continuous output using threshold functions, or if it's a categorical type of output from the model, uh, we classify this using discriminant functions. Uh, finally, once we've identified the, um, that there is a fault, we need to diagnose the fault or find out what's the root cause of it. Um, in, in this case, uh, again, it, it's split out between quantitative and qualitative forms. Uh, in, quantitative, in quantitative cases, we usually uh, look at the influence of the variables uh, and the amount of um, influence they would uh, provide to the prediction. Whereas in uh, qualitative models, we uh, build classification models that specifically uh, are tuned to, uh, to detect specific cases of, uh, of fault classes. Okay, next, I'm going to present a case study. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to go through quite quickly here. Um, but basically, our case study is on the Anglican butting process, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's to do with uh, leak detection on, 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 on the reactor. Uh, I'll just explain this a little more. Uh, so the converter is a reactor at the heart of the ACP, which is the Anglican butting process, uh, and its purpose is to oxidize base metal sulfides uh, from a combined matte feed into platinum group metal, rich matte slag, and sulfur dioxide um, rich up gas. Uh, so surrounding the, um, the reactor, there's a high pressure cooling system um, that has experienced multiple leaks over the recent years. And these can actually lead to explosions and pose a safety risk, uh, safety risk around the plant. The leaks are difficult to detect because they themselves are only traditionally been inspected visually uh, and, and only have been detected when they are in an advanced stage. So our intent for this work was to use a data driven uh, approach uh, to perform the leak detection. Um, we've actually built a machine learning model uh, that is used to then predict uh, the, 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 water, the water, water concentration in the off gas, and this provides us with an indication of whether a leak or not is occurring. Okay, so, so in, in terms of the, the case study, the objective was to enable the early detection of leaks on the ACP, HP cooling water circuit. Uh, the purpose was uh, to prevent and mitigate the impact of leak incidents. Um, and some of the challenges were on, on the technical side is that the data itself was noisy and sometimes inconsistent. Uh, the process was complex, it's nonlinear and it's discontinuous as well. Um, it can obviously it is inherently influenced by the operating process conditions. Uh, and uh, on, on the softer side, on, on the softer side, it, it was a novel approach to the problem, and it needed uh, some convincing and buying from the technical and operational teams. Um, an additional technical constraint or objective was that it needed to happen in real in near real time in order for it to be effective. So uh, just posing the, the problem again in, in terms of the fault detection framework and the four spaces, uh, the measurement space then uh, consisted of us um, looking through and, and cleaning out the data. 
Um, at, at the top here, you would find uh, this is the, the data cleaning process that we follow. Uh, it consisted of um, cleaning out the data, identifying the bad data, and then imputing them, finding out where the outliers existed, and then imputing those, and then finally smoothing the data so that we could maximize the signal from the noise that we have in the data. Uh, we also generated additional information, uh, some of it used to represent some parts of the data that we could not um, measure directly, as well as uh, some data to control the model and the execution of the model. Um, we also spent a fair bit of time exploring the, uh, the data that's, uh, uh, that we had received after cleaning it up, um, and this provided us with further insight about what's, uh, what's pertinent and what, what would be useful for us to use um, as uh, process variables for our model. Um, th this is a much more advanced type of visualization. Uh, this is actually a uh, dimension reduction type of clustering. Uh, and here again, it, it's just to look at um, what are the interaction between the data and um, what can we say about the data and, and how will it inform the modeling uh, that we would need to do. Um, so basically, this plot shows us 25 different models of the same data set uh, with different configurations of unsupervised modeling time. Uh, and it just basically tells us that there is a bit of a covariate shift in the data, which means that it, it changes over time. Uh, and this makes it quite difficult for the machine learning model uh, because the underlying distribution of the data does change over time. So uh, in order for us to account for uh, the modeling, uh, sorry, for, in order for us to account for the fault detection, we would then need to um, consider this in, in the way we did, uh, decide when we, when we find a leak or not. Uh, yeah, again, this, this, this is just a, a timeline trend of the, um, the target variable of the model. Um, the places in green is actually where we have experience in leak, and, and this was used to train and uh, validate the model. Uh, the first piece then included training the model on, 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 on the bits of data that are in yellow. Uh, we then um, tested the model against the, the bits that are in green. We configured the, the leak decision algorithm on, on the parts that are in the dark green, and finally, we tested the, the entire framework of the model uh, on the parts that are in blue. Okay, um, so, so, so the modeling steps uh, actually look like uh, the slow at uh, the top here. So once we evaluated the data, we then constructed the model, uh, validated the model, and then finally configured the, the leak decision and then tested the validation of the leak detection. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of the performance of the model shown on the uh, on, on a scatter plot, uh, it may be a little uh, not legible, but uh, ideally we'd, we'd want um, a 45 degree line here that would represent uh, the response and, and the truth of the, of the model uh, being highly correlated. Uh, so, so that's the performance on, on, on the training data set and on the validation data set as we'd expect because there's an underlying distribution shift, there's a slightly poorer performance. Uh, again, this is just the same random snippets of, um, of data shown over time to show that the foot of the model on, on, on the training data set and again on the uh, validation data set. Um, so considering that the underlying distribution of the data change, we needed to accommodate that uh, in the way we decide whether it is a leak or not. So effectively what we decided to do was to look at the um, accumulated re residual between the actual and prediction of the model uh, and um, accumulate that over a certain time period and then decide if the leak has occurred. Um, so we looked at that uh, all of the confidence limits of the, um, of the model prediction or the model accuracy uh, whenever we accumulated a certain uh, level of error for a, for a specific time period, um, that's when we decided that we posit positively identified what the leak was. Um, so yeah, so this looks quite intense, but that basically is uh, what that represents. Um, however, the, the problem with this is that there are may, many degrees of freedom here. So we then conducted a, simula a, a simulation to, um, to apply the, the validation model set to those different settings and for different configuration parameters. Uh, and this just shows you a, a six of those um, simulation plans um, and different settings of uh, accumulation period, uh, duration of the model, and as well as the threshold. So, so any bit that's basically in green would be a convenient or a, a useful configuration for the model. And we settled on a value that's somewhere around where my pointer is now. It has a duration of, uh, of 10 minutes uh, for a threshold of 15 over a period of, of 20 minutes. Um, and, you know, the dark shades actually show you cases where we would have either missed the leak detection or, uh, or, or created false positives as shown in this, this really light pinkish color here. Um, so, so that's where my slides end, but basically 
what we performed after that was uh, we implemented the system on um, on a live monitoring um, a dashboard, uh, as well as the, the HMI or SCADA uh, that's available to the operators. Uh, and this is actually a soft sensor, so it does not um, you know, so stop the plant or uh, you might to stop the plant automatically, but it just provides insight um, to the plant personnel about uh, if, if there is an impending leak or if there is a leak that's, that's being detected or not. Uh, so thus far, we've uh, implemented a system. It was able to detect leaks um, uh, during the course of last year. Uh, and this year, we've actually switched over the, the different phase of the reactor, so we haven't, fortunately, we haven't had any leaks uh, thus far. Okay, great. Um, so I'll end there. Um, and, you know, I'm looking, looking forward to the questions at the Q&A session at the end. Uh, and I think I'll hand over to John now for the next bit of his presentation. Cool. Thank you, Clyde. Let me share my screen. Cool. I trust everyone can see it. Yes, we can, John. Okay, good stuff. All right. So before I jump into the case study of the <coughs> uh, the boiler boiler trip detection case study, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of background behind Optimum Solutions and I guess yeah, specifically our smart mining and manufacturing focus area. So Optinum was founded in uh, around 30 years ago, and we were originally just the sole distributor of the MathWorks tools, and we branched into some consulting work. Um, yeah, so from around 2015, we have a fairly strong technical team and a fairly strong um, yeah, services approach. Uh, we're a level four BEE contributor, and many of our clients uh, make up, well, our clients make up many of the JSC top 40. So names like Powertech, Anglo-American, Sassol. And what our smart money, money and manufacturing um, focus area focuses on is unlocking profitable insights and solutions to real world problems using process data. And that comes in the form of a number of offerings such as advanced data visualization, smart monitoring and maintenance, as well as intelligent control. So, uh, moving on to the industrial water tube boiler application. So this, act, uh, yeah, the application of these boilers was typically on a, well, kind of uh, for this particular one was actually on a sugar refinery. And it was, um, yeah, this was the first one that we've rolled out. Um, the, what's, what's particular about sugar refinery boilers is they use big gas um, as a fuel, as a biogas. And what that is, is plant fiber left behind after the crushing of the sugarcane. So after it's crushed, they sort of squeeze the water out and dry it off and uh, keep it in storage until it's time to be burnt. And it actually quite, it actually has quite a substantial calorific value. So it's, it is quite an efficient biofuel. Theoretically, sugar, um, sugar mills produce more energy than they consume. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of what the steam is used for in the sugar refinery, so the, it, it's used for a number of things. So the processing steam is used for cooking and drying of sugarcane. And then if you can get the steam to be superheated, it actually fuels the two turbines that produce the electricity and machinery on the plants. In terms of boiler trip types um, that occur, so one possible cause of a boiler trip is excess motor current. And that's likely caused by a blockage in the flue gas flow. Um, and this trip is designed to effectively protect the furnace pressure and also just to yeah, protect against excessive heat inside the boiler. Uh, there's also a water level switch. So um, yeah, this triggers to protect the tubes of the economizer and the main bank when the, uh, when the water level in the steam drum is too low. And we'll take a look at, uh, look at what that looks like. Um, so it also, yes, yeah, so there's, there's two, there's two kind of levels to this trip. So there's a high, there is a high trip and a low trip and the high trip, uh, triggers to protect the turbine when the water level in the steam drum is too high. And yeah, that's because if you pass saturated, um, steam through the turbine, I believe it damages the turbines. Um, yeah, it ends up damaging the turbine over time. So high water levels, um, yeah, can cause corrosion in the turbine. And then the low water levels um, are, well, yeah, the, the trip happens to prevent the dry out of, this, of the tubes. Okay. So in terms of what we did for our clients at this point, um, so the challenge was that 
boilers are obviously process critical equipment. Um, and the trips result in unplanned downtime for the entire production process. And there can be substantial or significant loss of production on the mill um, and reduce the overall throughput. So what we did for them was we implemented an early trip detection system using tags uh, around the boiler as well as upstream of the boiler. And the detection system uh, was designed to warn the operators of impending trips with enough lead time such that the trips may be prevented. So as a result, we had fewer trips on average per month and an overall increase of plant production. All right. So jumping into what the solution workflow looked like. Um, so we started off with sensor data, um, as I mentioned, around the boiler, directly around the boiler and upstream of the boiler, and that's logged to an historian. And what we did there was access the data through, uh, yeah, access the data from the historian um, from a local server uh, that, yeah, that we have our MATLAB executable on. And at the same time, what happens is we write data back to that historian and we can analyze those results over time and actually see what effect uh, that the system is having, <clears throat> that our uh, machine learning algorithm is having on our uh, sugar mill. Uh, in terms of what exactly that executable file entailed, um, it was all designed in MATLAB. So it's all a, it is a MATLAB workflow, uh, but this is generalizable to sort of other languages and other tools. Um, what, that in, what that specific workflow entailed, and this is what we'll be talking about in this session. Uh, and Clyde's mentioned a couple of these. So uh, data access was the first step. So accessing the data from the historian, then pre-processing that data into something that we can actually use and feed into our machine learning model. Then we would run the live data through that machine learning model and finally visualize the results in the GUI. So that's graphical user interface. Um, then at the same time, what we do is write back those, uh, write those results back to the historian so they can actually be analyzed over time. So that sort of goes back to data access. Okay. So the data access was done uh, via OPC. And so what is OPC? Well, it spans a very sort of deep and wide range of applications through the uh, any sort of industrial process. Uh, so OPC is Open Platform Communications. And it's the interoperability standard for the secure and reliable exchange of data in the industrial automation space, as well as under, uh, and, and other industries. So why OPC? It is the industry standard and it allows for uh, live data as well as historical data access through any historian. Um, in addition to this, MATLAB has a OPC toolbox, which allowed us to access, the, um, access this information quite quickly and very easily. Um, I believe that actually got rebranded. I think it's called uh, the industrial, um, industrial Automation Toolbox, something, something like that. So for this particular project, uh, what we did was we were integrating with an OSI Pi historian and we integrated using the historical data access server. So uh, yeah. And then we were also able to integrate via the data access server and also the universal access server. So all of the functionality and all of the sort of um, yeah, server capabilities are inside that OPC toolbox, which is really quite useful. Um, yeah, we'll take a closer look. Yeah, we'll take a closer look in the next few slides exactly why we use the historical data access as opposed to just the straight data access. Okay. Um, so, wondering if there's a way to unpin this. Maybe not. Okay, it's fine. So, on to the data pre processing. So, how that looked from our perspective was we had raw data that was read in from the historical data access server. We then, yeah, through the pre-processing stage, we sorted, filled, and retimed the data into a timetable object. So a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more regular. And then finally moving on to our feature engineering um, exercise where we yeah, take our raw time series data or our sort of processed time series data and we turn it into features that our machine learning model can, um, can process, and can handle. Okay. Uh, so basic data pre-processing is made very easy with MATLAB's built-in functions. So we sorted the data into chronological order using the sort function. 
uh, finding and removing repeated times. So that's also quite easy. Filling in any missing values. And then finally resampling to a regular sample rate. So the next thing we did was uh, define what we call the reference table. And this was a table containing plant data from when the plant was stable and operating normally. And yeah, this was actually quite, um, yeah, this, this was quite important to define this table properly. Then the next thing that we defined through our sort of yeah, accessing the historical data was defining the query table. And that was a table, or what we called the query table. And that was a table containing the most recent plant data. And ultimately what was done uh, through the machine learning model was comparing the query table to our reference table and seeing if there, were, uh, if there was any substantial deviation. So comparing the new incoming data to data that we know is normal operation, and then um, making a decision on whether, whether we're moving towards a trip or not. Okay, um, in addition to this, uh, we had several, yeah, we, we did a number of transformations to the data as well. So we added what we call the difference table. So it gave us an indication of instantaneous rate of change between time steps. Um, we detect, oh, so we added a detect trip uh, in the data chunk. So if, the, if a trip had occurred, we looked at an indicator tag and we saw that if, um, yeah, if a trip had occurred, we had a tag that uh, sort of meant, um, was able to indicate that. And finally, we also centered and scaled our data appropriately. Okay, um, actually, so yeah, that wasn't finally. So uh, is this, yeah, okay. So the next up, we did a principal component analysis on both the training and the testing sets. So this did a number of things. Uh, it included, well, it reduced the dimensionality, so which allowed us to uh, visualize what the data looked like. And if we were to actually plot those first three principal components, we could take a look at them in the principal component uh, space. And what we can see here, and it was quite, um, it was quite a quite a revelation, and sort of formed the backbone of the project, was that um, so the color coded. So sorry about the colors, but uh, we've color coded here that uh, the blue dots or kind of the blue data points are normal. The red data points indicate a trip condition and sort of yeah, uh, leading up to the trip condition, we have a cyan color, green, then pink. And then uh, the black data points, I see, I see a few of them up there. The black data points indicated just complete downtime. So downtime being different from a trip, downtime being either planned or from for an extended period of time. And we noticed that uh, taking a look at our first three principal components, um, that most of the data was centered around the zero, zero, zero sort of, um, yeah, was clustered around uh, our origin of our principal component state space. And as we got closer to a trip, the data actually moved towards, well, away from this main cluster. And this was, as I mentioned, fairly insightful for us. And so as another potentially useful feature, what we did was we got the Mahalanobis distances of the training sets and the testing projections. Uh, to quantify, to help quantify that deviation from normal. And if you take a look at what those distances look like and you just plot them on a histogram, you can actually see, okay, well, in this case, we had our training distribution, which as you can see is uh, quite close to zero. So this would be like a normal query, uh, query table coming in. And uh, yeah, taking a look at what, those, what that sort of uh, distribution of distances look like and what the median, uh, what the median of that distribution is. And then as we moved closer towards, well, kind of as we moved towards it, we could see those distances increase in this space. And as those distances increase in the space, our distribution shifts and changes. So the shape changes as well as sort of how close it is to, to um, our reference table. So in a similar manner, we extracted other various uh, statistical parameters and um, yeah, including so we extracted median, interquartile ranges, uh, and then rates of change of the various parameters to give an indication of how quickly we were moving towards the trip, um, KL divergence and skewness. And these features ultimately describe various properties of the normal operation data set, the incoming query data set, and then also the differences between them. So that's sort of how we went about the modeling. All right. So as we move on, so running the data through the live machine learning model. So 
machine learning model we chose was a boosted forest. And um, how a boosted forest works is that it consists of a series of decision trees. So I'll, I've got a bit of an illustration for this. Um, so if you have a single decision tree, typically what happens is, and we're talking about classification decision trees. Um, so you would feed your full data set into the top of the tree. And then it's, you know, through the training and validation process, you would actually learn all of the decisions that need to be made based on each of the features. And depending on those decisions, we move towards either class one or class two or whatever the case is. Uh, that is the case for a single decision tree. Our boosted forest works, and it's slightly different, is that uh, similarly, uh, kind of similarly, similarly to the decision tree, we have a um, we feed our full data set into this tree, uh, but instead of getting classes out, we get an adjusted data set, and that adjusted data set actually feeds into a subsequent tree, which then moves on and on until right at the end, at the at the end of the sort of bottom tree, you get your class decision. So this adds a bit of complexity to the machine learning um, model. What well, kind of yeah to the to the overall decision tree sort of um, modeling type, and yeah, it really helped us. Uh, yeah, really helped us make some good decisions. Okay, so moving on from there, so we've got our data pre-processing and we've got our model, and now we are moving on to the development of the graphical user interface. So this is what the operators actually saw. Um, so once again, this end-to-end -end workflow was built in MATLAB. So everything from data access to deployment was, yeah, it's all, all in MATLAB. Um, so using object-oriented programming and the MATLAB app designer. And we, this particular one was deployed to an edge device as an executable file using MATLAB compiler. So this isn't the only way to do it. Um, so this, this just happened to be sort of the infrastructure we were dealing with. But it could vary. So, yep, the edge device was actually a very simple uh, desktop computer that would sit next to the boiler. Um, but we've run projects in the past where we actually deploy to an existing server that, um, yeah, that sits in the control room. Uh, we can also have, yeah, we also have cloud capabilities to deploy to the cloud. Okay, uh, a few details around here. So. Um, and how we sort of went about this. So we followed a variation of the model view controller framework or MVC. And that sort of looks like this where, um, so the user would interact with and use our controller uh, part of the controller then interacts with the model, which then updates the view and then that displays information to the user. Um, so the function of the GUI was to provide information to the operators and then inform them of potential trips so they could take action and prevent downtime. Uh, so refinements of the workflow involve uh, integrating directly with existing HMIs. So that's also something we can do. It's also, it's also something that we're busy uh, considering for one of our ongoing projects as well. Okay. So um, just so you have an idea of what the GUI looked like, so this is one of the tabs. So as you can see, we've got three different tabs here. Uh, the first uh, sort of panel in this tab just indicates what the status of our boiler trip advisor application was. Um, and over here, you can see, I'm not sure if you can see, it says success. So it's connected, it's been successfully connected. Uh, over here, we have OPC server details. So if you, yeah, and we can see it's an OSI, Pi, uh, OSI soft server. And um, yeah, so, integrating with both the data access server and the historical data access one. And then you'll notice over here, so we, uh, um, yeah, in the sort of main panel of this, um, of this tab, what we've done is print out uh, the query, pack, uh, the query um, table, I believe. So this shows, yeah, the timestamp as, um, yeah, as time goes on. So for the previous five or 10 minutes of data or whatever it was, and then the individual tags. So the user is able to actually see, okay, this is what our application is seeing right now. Just to ensure that there's no um, miscommunications between the, uh, yeah, between the application and, and the um, server. Then moving on to, so we're gonna skip the advisor tab and move on to the details tab for the sake of time. So in the details tab, we've got quite a few details um, about sort of, what the algorithm is doing and what the algorithm is, is um, outputting. 
So start at the top here. So immediately we see this is for boiler number two. And uh, we can see that our next packet time is gonna come in at whatever a certain time we're expecting our next packet time. We can see when our healthy data range is. So um, yeah, just to confirm that it's not too far in the, excuse me, not too far in the past. Um, then we've got this boiler status panel and I'll get through the different, I'll go through the, okay, well, yeah, I guess um, this, is a good, this is a good place to sort of uh, stop and explain this part. So um, we chose a classification boosted forest and the different classes we had were effectively um, healthy, which is a trip is greater than 40 minutes away. Then uh, between 30 and 40 minutes away, between 20 and 30 minutes away, between 10 and 20 minutes away, and then between zero and 10 minutes away. And those are our five, those are our five classes that we were dealing with, um, yeah, that we chose as an output. Um, yep, yeah, and then based on those classes, so over here, we've got our current packet probabilities. So we output our probabilities and display them here for the user to see if they so wished. Um, this particular data point, we can see that it's probably healthy, the highest probabilities in the healthy kind of, uh, yeah, it's falling into the healthy class. And then uh, we can take a look at the probability distribution as well. Um, on top of that, we designed a health value to be able to trend over time. And the idea was that um, but, uh, this exists, but this value can exist between zero and one, I believe, or zero and, yeah, I think it was zero and one. And um, as time goes on, you can see sort of what the health of the boiler is doing. So as it, if it trends downwards and if it sort of looks like it's going down, that means that a boiler is, the boiler is getting closer and closer to a trip. So in addition to that, um, as we all know, um, having this sort of algorithm is more useful if we have an idea of predictor importance and which tags are actually going to um, cause, which, which tags we're expecting to cause the next trip. And that's exactly what this panel over here displayed. So this displayed our sort of most important tags and it displayed the top 10 contributing tags to this particular data point. And you could see that, okay, well, if it is trending downwards, you know, it'll be due to um, most, uh, you know, most of that contribution is coming from one of these particular tags. And by communicating that to the operator, we're able to actually do almost a root cause analysis. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna fly through some of the results. So the results were, um, yeah, we ran the trial for, uh, I think it was three weeks and the results were quite, um, yeah, quite insightful. So over here in blue, we've plotted the predicted health value. So that's sitting quite high and then it, it dips down. And then the orange line is the letdown valve position. And effectively, um, yeah, that's one of the events we were trying to pick up. So if the operator closes the letdown valve, that means that he expects a trip to start happening. And uh, this result was pretty cool because, um, so the health value uh, starts trending downwards over here, we can see uh, before the letdown event occurs. And in this particular instance, our algorithm actually detected that deterioration in boiler health about 45 minutes before the operator started closing the letdown valve. So it was pretty, pretty substantial. So then next up in the second week, so once again, our health value is in blue and our orange line is our trip state. So one indicates normal operation if this orange line is up here and then zero indicates uh, that our boiler tripped. So the series of trips were indicated by a low health value as we can see over here. And yeah, the, you can see the boiler sort of oscillating between a tripped and not, not trip state. And then um, as, as, this, as this set of trips passes, we can see that boiler, uh, boiler health increases again after that's, after that's done. Okay, last set of results uh, just to look at. So this is in the third week. Uh, once again, in blue, we have our predicted health value and our orange line is once again, our trip state. So we, our health, so we, we had a bit of a fluctuating health value over here, but still sort of in an acceptable range. And then it dipped down quite substantially. And we can see that that false positive at midnight on the 3rd of September could have actually been an early warning for the trip that happened at uh, yeah five minutes past one on the 3rd of September. So uh, that was really cool to see. And yeah, that resulted in potentially a 65 minute lead time, which is uh, yeah very, very, uh, well, it's acceptable in terms of being able to prevent the, prevent the boiler trip. 
All right, so uh, sort of in conclusion, and yeah, I think so. So, uh, so the results look promising. So we did make some successful predictions. Um, and there was a distinction between a regular trip and a letdown event. Uh, we could have, so we ended up with a fair, fair number of false positives and false, false negatives. So our improve, our sort of next steps would be to try to improve those. Uh, from the analysis, um, it was identified that our boiler trip advisor required a better definition of the boiler's healthy states. So uh, yeah, that's another very important refinement. Um, so that'll give a bit of baseline and also yeah, it's required to identify the critical tags and the healthy ranges of their uh, their values as well. So going through the list of tags with the, with the sort of engineers and understanding where the healthy operating operating ranges are. Um, so since the boiler trip advisor already successfully predicted the trip, uh, this should improve the uh, capabilities of the boiler trip advisor. Yeah, so all of this sort of contributing towards a better product. Okay, so final summary and conclusions uh, for this um, case study. So uh, once again, end-to-end -end solution built in MATLAB. So that goes from prototyping to data access, data pre-processing, training and deployment of the machine learning mod uh, model, and then um, yeah, deploying everything to an executable file that is able to uh, run live on site. The live deployment showed some promising results, but there's definitely room for refinement. The solution approach was general and could definitely be applied to a variety of applications and not just the detection of boiler trips. Um, yeah, and with a relatively small investment, we got some very tangible results. And yeah, with a little bit of refinement, this could actually make a really, really big difference uh, in this particular business. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's it from me. And I think we, now we can actually move on to the Q&A, if that's fine. And I'm going to stop sharing in the meantime as well. Thanks, John. Uh, I think I'll take over just to answer the first few questions that are um, for me from Tanya. Um, so Tanya's first question is, which dimension NLT reduction technique did you use during your feature space step uh, of your phone detection workflow? Um, so, so the the, <clears throat> the algorithm that I chose was uniform manifold uh, approximation projection or UMAP for short, um, and it's compatible to TSN. Um, the UMAP projection, what it allows you to do is, uh, well, firstly, there's no assumption about the underlying uh, data distribution. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't actually require you to specify whether it's, it's a normal distribution or some long tail discrete distribution uh, of your data points. It assumes that all of your data points are locally connected. Uh, to each other, and they are configurable parameters that allow you to um, to basically uh, increase the, the level of clustering or, or to force it to, to actually cluster or to, or to noise itself. Um, you also are able to reduce it all the way down to two dimensions or up until the, the same number of dimensions as, as your data. Uh, and I think that's one of the advantages of a PCA. Uh, with PCA, you are sort of restricted with um, you know, depending on the variation that you have in the data. So for example, if your first two principal components or three principal components can't extend enough variation, you still have quite a few extra dimensions that you, you're not catering for, especially visually. Uh, but I must state that this is, a, you know, it's, it's more of um, a visual technique. And if it wasn't actually used directly in, um, in the modeling process uh, per se. Uh, so it was just used to help us understand what's happening with the data and, and to just prove that there is some sort of shift in the data. And that actually follows on then to the second question, which is when you talk about a distribution shift, are you referring to data that is exhibiting signs of non-steady state operation? Uh, do you have an idea of what causes shifts, SP changes, disturbances, et cetera? So, so there's a lot of unmeasured variables that are in the system that we that is not actually encountered for in, um, um, in the model. Uh, so part of that would include uh, the ambient moisture. Uh, and you know, especially with, um, with this problem, what we're trying to predict is uh, the off-gas moisture. Uh, and that's highly influenced by the material sort of moisture, which could be coming in from the air or the, um, the air that's, that's actually one of the streams that's coming into the system, as well as, uh, you know, if, if some of the material or the feed material is left outside in the rain, it does actually absorb some water from, um, from, from just of the fact of it being out in the rain. Um, there's also a whole lot of uh, pyrometallurgical type of influences in terms of qualities of the types of materials that are being fed. Um, so, so that plays a significant, uh, you, you know, role in the thermodynamics and 
and, and how and, and, and what sort of uh, reactions occur in, um, in the reactor. So we, we couldn't actually and we couldn't actually include that in the model. And the primary reason for that was um, the quality, the, the lab quality data wasn't available or wasn't as frequent as Pi. And uh, what we needed to do was, you know, balance out the accuracy against the implementation. Uh, so that was one of the main re uh, yeah, so that was the reason why we could include all of that information. Um, second is that we sort of pose the problem as a material balance mainly, uh, while just, in, you know, dropping in a few more key operating variables as, uh, as drivers for the process. Um, okay. Is there anything else for me to answer here? Um, okay, yes, so, um, so, so responding to Jason's question about um, adoption at site. So, you know, fortunately we were, uh, we were assisted by site. It, it wasn't something that was, uh, you know, produced and, and, and then being sold to them. So they were involved in the process uh, from the beginning. Uh, in fact, they provided the subject matter, uh, SME, you know, the SME knowledge uh, that helped us uh, fine tune the model as well. Um, so, you know, so although this is the output, uh, there has been a, a lot of um, iterative steps uh, building the model, uh, deciding what to keep in, what to, what to throw away. Uh, and the, we also ran this model in, um, and the whole analytic in, in, in sort of a, a test phase where we had this running in the background before the releases to the, to the broader operational team. Um, and, and that helped us, you know, establish uh, and build confidence in the model as well as tune it um, so that it could give us the results that we were looking for. Okay. Um, yeah, I think those are all of the questions for me. If there's anything out there, please, um, please type them either in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, John, I think there's a few questions for you there. Cool, thank you. Um, so the question comes from Tanya. And um, in terms of, yeah, so, so this is what the question is. In terms of those identified sensor measurements that have the highest contribution to an unhealthy index value, does your algorithm rely on the operator to piece together the highest predictive variables in order to move towards uh, back towards a healthy state? Or is this something that you plan on automating? So it's a really good question. Um, so at the moment, um, so as, yeah, as I mentioned, as you sort of picked up, so what those are is, uh, yeah, so what those are are um, the most important predictors for that particular data point. And um, so, and ultimately we do sort of rely, well, we do trust the operator to, to know their plants because they, um, they do, yeah, they, they work with the equipment every day. So they are very aware of um, what are the higher risk kind of pieces of equipment and what's likely to cause a trip, that sort of thing. Um, and this is leaning towards a bit, I guess more on the, so uh, not, not quite on the automation side, but definitely towards the um, uh, root cause analysis side. So to be able to uh, firstly detect a trip uh, well in advance, so detect a trip 45 minutes or uh, you know half an hour in advance, and then be able to also um, uh, say what type of trip that will be. So it'll be a high level high level trip in the boiler or a, or a current trip, um, you know high current trip for example, something like that. Um, yeah. Cool. So that's uh, that's the idea, and that's sort of um, yeah that that's the plan, and that's the vision for the rest of this project. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Tanya. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Is there anything else? And I see a hand raised by uh, uh, Passion Chicano. I'm not sure if there's a question. I yeah, see that um, person has dropped off the chat, so uh, I don't think that person is available yeah. anymore. I don't see any further questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, if you'd like to then just close off, I think we can, we can end the webinar. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you for attending everyone. Um, if, I guess, yeah, if you have any questions, feel, uh, feel free to contact us through Sim or directly. Um, otherwise, yeah, I hope everyone has a good day further. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Clyde.